good evening my voice is heard okay good yes you are uh, good evening this is uh, dr ahmed uh, it's our great pleasure and honor in sudanese surgical club to welcome professor raj shinoy again for the second time in our forum uh, the, the previous session about uh, small bowel obstruction was um, uh, fruitful and useful and most of the people the feedback from them is they say is it's uh, uh, basically um, a very unique presentation they commend you prof and uh, professor raj you know he's a professor of surgery in um, uh, india in kmc manipal india and his achievements and his contribution to the medical education and the international literature and surgery is uh, can speak the, about themselves. So I don't think our my humble introduction will uh, will be uh, enough. But uh, I think your contributions speaks by themselves. So Prof, um, uh, may we can enjoy your talk. Can you start, please? Thank you. So. Uh, thank you very much. So I will start now. And uh, so thank you all of you for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you again. Today we'll be talking about uh, acute colonic obstructions. You know, the large intestine or colon, quite a big uh, from starting from the cecum till the rectum here. So Carcinoma colon definitely is the most important cause of obstruction. And uh, we would like to see other causes of obstruction also. So we'll be going in this order. Few of them are more common things. We'll take up first and then go for the colonic obstruction due to cancer. These are the few for completion sake. And I have one or two small case capsules here. So. This terminology we have discussed last time. Just want to give you that uh, strangulation happens in a closed loop obstruction, especially sigmoid volvulus. When it undergoes twisting, you know, it goes for a gangrene uh, very fast. We have discussed mesenteric ischemia last time, so we'll not touch upon that. So I already told you what do you mean by closed loop obstruction. And these are a few things. Uh, lastly, I'll be speaking about pseudo obstruction. This entity uh, is uh, very well uh, described in a colon. There's one term you may find incarcerated hernia. It's basically an obstruction only, but the obstruction is caused by the fecal matter. It can happen in umbilical hernia with obstruction, uh, where the transus colon herniates and cause obstruction is due to the fecal matter rather than narrow neck. That's what is the meaning of the word incarcerated hernia. So we'll go to now acute colonic obstruction by sigmoid volvulus. It's common in uh, Indian, uh, uh, especially in Punjab. The rice eating uh, is one of the things which is uh, uh, blamed for this. Eastern Europe, Uganda, some cases. and. Uh, one thing important is this is one condition. It produces a dramatic uh, appearance. You know, suddenly distension, hypovolemic shock, and most of them are elderly patients, and uh, they can succumb very fast. So more common in men, and it's about uh, in the volvulus. We have two thirds in the sigmoid and one third being cecal volvulus. So it's an important thing also to realize. A pregnant woman can come with acute abdominal pain and a distension. Uh, sigmoid volvulus is one of the things also to be kept in mind. So the few important causes have been mentioned. That's here. You can see, you know, long mesocolon here. The loaded colon. So high fiber diet, basically. And a diverticle with a band there, attached band. So this is what long colon I mentioned. And narrow attachment. So these are the few important causes for a sigmoid obstruction. There are a few other things we should know that uh, these are various causes, including mental disturbations, hypothyroidism, Parkinson's disease, 
these are the few so when you treat these patients with these drugs you should keep it in mind and this is again a ogilvy is a basically a pseudo obstruction it can precipitate a valvulus so how does it present with obviously we are today concentrating on acute one it's a basically an anti clockwise direction anti clockwise direction and about one and a half turns means it goes for a gangrene the so much distension because of a diffusion of a carbon dioxide and uh, you can see here very uneven uh, grossly distended abdomen the severe hypovolemic shock you know which occurs very early within 6 to 8 hours and if it's a complete one and a half turns means gangrene occurs very fast rectal examination it's empty you percuss here you may find it's on it's like a you know drum drum like thing so that's what is a sigmoid valvulus so this is a chronic variety can also occur due to some twisting and untwisting so how do you make a diagnosis you take a plain x ray please remember this patients will be sick if they are not able to stand in the erect position you should not make them to stand they may collapse in the radiology department itself especially who are having hypotension but if you a patient is reasonably stable these are the two signs described with the two fluid levels that's omega sign or it's also called as you know as the barium enters it narrow down so to rectum that's called as birds big sign so you can see you no know, two fluid levels see that such enormous distended loop that's classical of a sigmoid valvulus this is just to show you how it presents so dramatically within 6 hours this was our case when you opened uh, this was the picture and uh, huge distension due to a lot of fluids there because it becomes a closed loop carbon dioxide diffusion also is more here so that's what is sigmoid valvulus you can see stretching of the mesentery there congestion edema so all this can happen you can see the so much dilated loop so can we try non operative yes as long as patient is not in shock you have to keep it in mind this state no guarding no rigidity that means probably one can make a try if can put a sigmoidoscope flexible one or a flatus tube and i don't go too much 25 to 30 cm means you are hit the sigmoid there if you are lucky sometimes you pass uh, uh, suddenly patient passes flatus and a fluid there so obstruction is relieved the why you want to by this time because you want to do an elective surgery you know always in emergency there is a more chance of a mortality and morbidity especially in this type of patients most of them are elderly they are in shock they may be having a cardiovascular some events so it's important that uh, you buy some time here for resuscitation of course if you are not able to do successfully you may have to do a resection now as for the resection is concerned yes given a choice you open resect do anastomosis what has been called a single stage resection is the best provided the colon is not much of loaded with the fecal matter and if you have slighted doubt patient is stable you can try this anyway your two contents are there you can give some saline wash till the contents of the colon are clear however when in doubt if your patient is sick you can also put a score karnofsky criteria or a scoring it will come now so if you feel that is a gangrene is there proximal bowel is loaded with the fecal matter and you can only just do a resection and uh, what's called as hartman's procedure which all of you know uh, bring that uh, descending colon outside and uh, distal end you can close and you have to come back and do a colorectal anastomosis yes second operation hartman's can be sometimes difficult so that is why i mentioned some people consider the single stage resection but remember we need the patient here very sick patient don't try to venture in the anastomosis so if the loop is not gangrenous we have a third choice you can fix the sigmoid or you can even a 
broaden the narrow attachment. So, or you can fix it. I have mentioned to you about the post abdominal wall, you can fix it. So, these are the few things. Now, imagine your patient is very, very sick, general condition is very poor, dehydrated, even in sepsis, gangrene is there. This mentioned about the Paul Michaelis procedure, just bringing it out and do a resection there. And uh, you see, just both loops have been brought out here, and even you can do a resection later. That's what I'm trying to say. But uh, nowadays, it is not really done. Today, you do the resection. At least your minimum thing is the resection. And you can get the both ends out. Scoring system helps here. 100 means is normal. So otherwise, some are, these patients can have 20, 30, 40. So that is a time you may have to consider other options. Sequel volume, as I mentioned to you, not very common. When colonic obstruction is uh, considered, we have to speak about cecal valvulus. This is a rare cause. So cecum typically, and not common because cecum is a relatively fixed structure. I don't say it's completely fixed structure. You can have an, you know, unascended, uh, you know, an undescended cecum. It may be a little high up also. It can have a complete encircled mesentery also. Can undergo valvulus. In all such cases, better to do the resection. As you can see, the volvulus there, and you can see the tinea so much hypertrophy. So, any difference you can make out? As I mentioned already, cecum always goes clockwise, sigmoid anticlockwise. I mentioned all these causes to differentiate cecal volvulus and sigmoid. And here comes it produces a single fluid level and a kidney or a round shaped shadow in the plain x-ray that is the cecal volvulus whereas sigmoid i mentioned to you about omega sign etc now it's one interesting situation as i mentioned to you cecum can undergo volvulus but what happens sometimes the whole cecum ascending colon itself can turn it may not be a complete twist but complete turn to other side and that is called as a bascule. So always when it turns like that, there is a band there across the ascending colon. This you may have to divide. So this condition is called as cecal bascule. This is what I meant by a sign. You can see the typical round shape or a bean shaped. This is the sigmoid volvulus, right? So you can see it's on this side. So Sigmoid will have two loops, two fluid levels. It is on the left side. But you don't know sometimes sigmoid volvulus can be so massive, it can cause a confusion. I will give you one small case capsule. Just a young boy, see here, 24 year old, male. He was operated for anorectal anomaly at three months of age. It was a low imperforate anus. They have done a anoplasty from below. And it comes with this, you can see you now, a abdominal pain. And uh, that was pulp, on palpation, this was palpable, like with gurgle. So we don't know what was the diagnosis at that time. We thought it's an intestinal obstruction because patient has vomiting. And he says colicky abdominal pain. And uh, on percussion, resonant note was there. And we took an x-ray. Now, the first one is supine, the second one is erect. What, for our surprise, nothing is here. Look at here. What we are supposed to get the cecum here and uh, setting colon is not here. But uh, this is what we got. We also did not know what is the diagnosis at this stage. Patient is young and uh, patient was not having any hypotension shock. Just we could get a CT done here, and uh, this is just before the CT. This is what was actually plain X-ray. You can see now. This is the one in loop, and this is what was here. See, and uh, that was the CT pictures. Obviously, you need to see all pictures. Basically, these are all the dilated portion of the colon and uh, cecum there, and uh, we are able to trace it, and it was. Radiologist reported a cecal volvulus. 
I opened this case as a midline incision, and uh, you know what was this? This was the one which was palpable in this picture. This, whatever the cecum from here has gone here, this area, and it was dilated so massively. You can see here, and this is the ascending colon. I showed you one ascending colon that X-ray. Where the colon is on the actually on the left side. This should have actually been right side, but now it is on the left side with so much dilated stretch. And I was talking to you about a band, you know. This was that band which was constricting. And once we release this, we were able to decompress this. And we did appendicectomy here, decompressed it. I was almost about to resect this, but a young boy of 21. I didn't want to do hemicolectomy. So remember, cecopexy is not a good operation. So we did appendicectomy and we decompressed the bowel from there. And I just put few sutures for this ascending colon to the lateral abdominal wall. Ascending colon to the lateral abdominal wall. In fact, this patient comes even after uh, 10 years. Uh, in fact, last year I saw him and he's doing well. This is our paper only, this is myself only, 2010. My case, we have published this. And uh, this is what was the case called as a bascule. So this is a French term for a seesaw and the seesaw and the balance, the whole thing has gone to the other side. It can be associated with the mal rotation of the gut. That has to be also kept in mind. So the I brought this case because to know that Whenever we have one congenital anomaly, remember in this patient, he had that anorectal malformation. Uh, it's better that think of other anomalies. This patient had a hypermobile cecum, and uh, I mentioned to you what are the problems there. So it was whole mobile cecum and ascending colon has rolled to the other side. So these are some of the anomalies which have been associated with these conditions, including what's called vertebral anal, trisomy, etc. So just for the academic interest. So I hope the it's clear about the, the sickle volvulus, right? Now we'll go to the more common problem is the acute colonic obstruction due to colorectal cancer. Uh, let me make it very clear. I am not talking about carcinoma colon here. I'm only talking about colorectal cancer presenting as obstruction. And you know that uh, it's a quite a third most common cancer and also cancer death. So if you look at that, 80% of the obstructions are due to large bowel obstruction, especially emergencies. So you can see that. And the most common site is usually left side. Almost 75% are distal to the splenic flexure. So that is why if you are not able to do a colonoscopy even in a regular setting, at least it is mentioned, at least do a left-sided left -sided colonoscopy because at least you'll pick up this more than 75% of the cases. And unfortunately, perforation occurs just at the proximal side, especially left colon. And uh, once it perforates, the cure is lost, prognosis is bad, and uh, morbidity is also very high. So some percentage for interest. So you can see here, sigma colon is 40%. Then that junction, we are, I will not talk about rectum here. So because rectal carcinomas behave totally different way. So, but this is the list. When you talk about the colonic obstruction means, we generally, this is what we are supposed to know. So diagnosis is not difficult. Colic abdominal pain, vomiting, distension, vomiting is rare. So there's some statistics here to know that obstipation or uh, fecal matter they fail to pass, distension, etc. The difference between the small intestinal obstruction and large, small intestinal patients vomit more, obviously large intestine constipation is more, and they have bleeding per rectum, whereas small intestinal obstruction, you don't find that central abdominal distension in small intestinal obstruction, peripheral in a large bowel obstruction. Look for, because we are talking about the cancer here. So look for all these things, which you may be able, don't miss. Again, I repeat, 
do a rectal examination to rule out a carcinoma of the rectum. The few things remember, colon is a large structure I mentioned. Carcinoma of the cecum is notorious, can present as acute appendicitis with obstruction there, or it can present as a intersusception, ileo colic intersusception due to a cancer of the cecum. So as an obstruction. Now the one more important thing here is this carcinoma splenic flexure. You know it's called as a hidden colon. When you open the abdomen, that is one area which is what's called a blind or will not be able to get it unless you carefully look for it. So it's important to look for the splenic flexure and the sigmoid is obviously many times very clear. So if you see this picture, this is the terminal ileum. This is the growth there. And this is, this is the ileum which has gone in. And that is ascending colon there. And this was a case of a intersusception due to carcinoma of the cecum. Of course, this is a tubular structure of a left colon. As I mentioned to you, if the perforation occurs at the tumor site, lucky peritoneal contamination is a very localized prognosis is good. But what happens if the perforation is proximal to the tumor site? This spread results in a diffuse peritonitis and a septic shock. I will give an example to you. If there's a carcinoma of the rectosigmoid, much proximally if you perforate, spillage is much more than it happens at the site of the uh, whatever stricture. Very often these patients are sick. Remember fecal peritonitis is the bad peritonitis, significant mortality there. They have fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, etc. Abdomen is having a lot of tenderness, guarding, rigidity, toxic symptoms appear. And uh, if they go for a high leukocyte count or a neutropenia or even lactic acidosis means it suggests perforation or even necrosis. So how do you manage such patients? Diagnosis of colonic obstruction is, may not be that difficult. It's important that to look for at least uh, there's an Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group or Kurnowski, whichever way you want to. This basically to assess the fitness, as I mentioned to you, are they really moribund, sick patients? Because that is what is uh, important when you manage these patients. They cannot undergo a major resection if the performance score is very, very poor. Remember, last time also mentioned, CT should not delay the diagnosis. That is what I am writing here, very important. But remember, if you have a chance to do it, please do it. You can always know the obstruction and resectability. This is important here. There are structures some of them infiltrate the local structures and sometimes even they make it unresectable. It can also diagnose the spread of the disease. <clears throat> so we should know this chart. No doubt you can say that I can diagnose a in a plain X abdomen. See, you can do ultrasound and you can even a barium enema, but this is not done nowadays. When you have CT scan, you can see the sensitivity and specificity in the diagnosis of a carcinoma of the colon. So if possible, CT has got a lot of advantages to know about the disease, local infiltration, even a spread into the parotid nodes, multiple seconds in the liver. So pericolic abscess, you can diagnose with this. If necessary, you can aspirate, ultrasound guided aspiration and epic tail condition improves, then you can take up. There's no rule that it should be done immediately. <clears throat> Whatever it is, the patient has come. These are some of the basic uh, things you need for any, I mentioned right, nasogastric tube, only if the patient has got significant distension, otherwise it's not required. We require some blood, temperature, pulse, respiration. You give broad spectrum antibodies, correct the electrolytes and fluid, and uh, do a exploratory laparotomy and uh, that's what you do 
for the colonic obstruction. There are a few important other things I would like to mention here that uh, remember acute colonic obstruction is more dangerous because what happens is there is so much distension, there is ischemia and there can be a perforation and the sepsis. So it's important that once there's a perforation, oncologically they don't do well. With this small background, we have discussed a lot of things about colonic cancer soon, but I'll just give one small case report. Look carefully, a 68 year lady was admitted with large bowel obstruction. Pain X-ray showed a intestinal obstruction and a scan showed a sigmoid colonic growth. No metastasis. So, exploratory laparotomy was done. This was done in a peripheral hospital. And the surgeon saw a three centimeter growth and he immediately resected that. He did an resection and he did anastomosis and he wrote a notes and everything was fine. But on the fourth post operative day, because you start feeding the patient that time, and distension increased. So for another three days, distension kept on increasing. He initially thought this could be related to paralytic ileus. He even put a nasogastric tube, but patient was getting severe colicky abdominal pain. Now, interestingly, what really has gone through? It is no perforation here because patient is not in sepsis. There is obstruction. Either it's an early adhesive obstruction, but patient was having colicky abdominal pain. See here. It cannot be paralytic ileus. It cannot be even a leak or etc. Now, what is interesting? So, you underwent a surgery. Findings was anastomosis perfect, but transverse colon was hugely dilated. Why does transverse colon is dilated? There was a growth in the splenic flexion. So, resection anastomosis was done. That is a different story. But now what are the lessons we have learned in this case? I called that surgeon and asked him. He agreed. You know, he opened the abdomen. He saw a retrosigmoid growth. He resected it. He did not trace the entire colon. Interestingly, in this patient, carcinoma of the splenic flexure was missed also by the CT scan. So, when you do a laparotomy for any condition for that matter, even if you know there is a cause, it's better that you trace the entire colon, entire small intestine to look for multiple lesions because especially synchronous carcinoma is known in colonic obstruction. And I told in the beginning only splenic flexure carcinoma is called as a hidden carcinoma. So, it's important to realize that uh, whenever you open the patient with the for malignancy and especially colonic cancer, look for synchronous because you have not done colonoscopy in this patient before. Because first time patient presented with the acute sigmoid obstruction and he opened, he could remove that tumor, but the splenic flexion lesion was missed. Few images of carcinoma of the cecum present. Flexure is the narrowest portion. There's an area where there's acute bend there. So it was a luminal obstruction there. And this was the case of a obstruction. So that means it's important that obstructing large bowel cancer is important. So 10% can present as acute obstruction. And all of you know that, what will you do? Traditionally, whenever you used to get a carcinoma of the colon, you know, it was a standard practice to say, you do a colostomy first. That was told when I was doing a post-graduation, first do a colostomy. Later you go and dissect, third stage procedure, you do anastomosis, but today, Primary resection is gaining acceptance. As I already mentioned to you, provided general condition of the patient is good 
and you have people with you to support you uh, to give a good care of the patient just to remember few situations which you encounter this is what we'll be discussing now onwards one is a curative intent not possible at all carcinoma of the colon let us say multiple metastasis in the liver and lungs so it's not possible but he has got obstruction now second int curative intent is possible means there is a growth there there could be a metastasis but it's possible now this is also potential curative and last obstruction with the perforation so that is what is the treatment which we are going to discuss now look at this situation what will you do now look at this that's what i mentioned about performance status of a 76 year old lady here you can see there so our goal is to relieve the obstruction section especially three choices for the left and these are the two choices for the right let us uh, now you can see here endoscopic colonic stents these are the decrease they they decrease the morbidity but they have they have shown a clinically high success rates but uh, it all depends upon the clinic the situation advantage is that they relieve the obstruction that's the advantage but there are stent related complications are there including delayed perforation stent can migrate so stent as i already told you advantage being you can immediately relieve the obstruction give chemotherapy what is most of the time it is done is a diverting ostomy patient has come with acute colonic obstruction patient has already metastasis we know that cure is not possible and especially for a distal rectal cancers you do a diversion ostomy you can do even a colon or even a terminal ileum because remember this there is so much pelvic pain tenesmus incontinence after stent if you put a stent for this lower rectal cancers these are some of the complications so the reason why diverting ostomy is better now for some reason bowel is not showing healthy bowel is gangrenous you can go ahead and do a resection so these are the three choices you have got even for a stage 4 disease stenting ostomy and a resection now what about right side right colonic cancer preferably we do a resection but it's palliation you can only do a internal bypass so ileum to transverse colon or if you are doing you can do even a loop colostomy but one thing you should not do is a decompressive cecostomy it doesn't work you can just do a simple ileo transverse anastomosis and come out it's tempting to do cecostomy 
it doesn't work so very very unstable patient what will you do you have got a colonic cancer with the perforation obstruction look at the ph here severe lactic acidosis is there he has got a septic shock he is on inotrope our aim as i mentioned earlier was only to control that's a damage control secondary goal is later so first is now open the abdomen take out all the septic focus and do a minimum thing come out including a simple colostrum so up to now whatever i have spoken is a no cure is possible in that group now look at a curative setting now this is a 63 year old lady she has got a 6 months history of erectile bleed colonoscopy shows a sigmoid carcinoma 17 cm and biopsy said no carcinoma this is typical you have a growth and uh, she has come to the emergency department distension and pain uh, what options we have now we have any studies for that yes this slide i brought only to tell you one stage resection that's what i was telling you that earlier we used to have stage procedures now it's already one stage procedure not only for right colon even for the left colon the study has shown so much conclusion here that anastomosis can be safely performed so if possible do a resection anastomosis now there is something called as intraoperative irrigation a lot of papers came here that uh, you can do appendicectomy put the saline through it empty it anything like that but uh, they have found that uh, you know some cases it may be necessary but majority neither neither means they are not useful at all but intraoperative decompression can be considered if you have got a anastomosis site loaded with the fecal matter following a resection so these are the few things which have to be kept in mind in these patients so irrigation not much of a role but decompression can be done just before anastomosis so again these are the papers for the right side so where they have undergone a primary anastomosis with a good results of more than 82% so whenever we do a curative intent you can do a resection with a double end stoma two ends and later you can always do a surgery and close that so as i mentioned to you earlier only your patient important thing is about this how sick is your patient he has got a renal failure he may be having immunocompromised status maybe hiv maybe diabetes this is anesthesiologist asa class 3 and 4 disease malnutrition so now you want to do a curative resection but he may not tolerate as i mentioned already you can put the karnofsky score or iso scoring and if you feel it's not good candidate then what is been called as a bridge bridge means you need to prepare this patient how you can bridge them so bridge is nothing but by doing a stenting or a diversion ostomy even in curative intent don't confuse this for the first talk which i gave just now that is for the that time the cure is not possible so you are stented or done an ostomy here it is not like that he is a sick patient if the patient is fair enough you do a single stage resection if the patient is having this criteria no doubt cure is possible but wait for some time you need to buy some time either again do a stenting or a ostomy resuscitate the patient improve his nutrition here improve the renal failure look after the antibiotics and uh, fitness cardiology evaluation control the blood pressure diabetes and then take him for surgery so that uh, results will be good after that so this is something which you need to know what is called as a bridge so what is the advantage is this all these things which i mentioned because most of these are multidisciplinary approach so you need to remember prepare this patient for surgery so what is the advantage of the stent now i mentioned to you shorter hospital stay 
already mentioned earlier, clinical rates of almost 98% success in patients who have been stented, relieve the obstruction, uh, they improve the condition of the patient. That's what is a bridge to surgery for malignant obstruction and the results should be good. But uh, you don't have a facility, but again, can do a ostomy because no need for tumor manipulation in these patients who are done a ostomy. Just do a simple transverse colostomy that will relieve the obstruction for a left sided tumors and later you can do a resection. Although you can even do an ileostomy, depends upon your situation. So Pileostomy versus loop colostomy. This is what I was talking to you. Whenever you have got obstruction, please see to that you have a. If there is a competent ileocecal valve, uh, that time you need to have a colostomy. This is important. So whenever a colonic obstruction you open, see the cecum is distended properly or not, and see the ileum is also distended. If the ileum is distended well, that means to say that. Ileocecal valve is incompetent, you may be able to get away with the ileostomy, otherwise, you need to do a colostomy. So, now right sided loop transverse colostomy in erectile cancers, it's important that it is easier to do because transverse colon is mobile and uh, it avoids the risk of damage to the marginal arcade. This is because instead of doing a left sided colostomy, you can do a right side because I mentioned. Colon is easy, you can easily get it out, right? So these are some of the advantages for a, this type of cancers. So that is what I mentioned about the transverse colostomy. Now, potentially curative. Now, what is this potentially curative? 50 year old healthy man, colonoscopy shows a 30 centimeter growth from the anal verge and a biopsy is adenocarcinoma. This is the PET scan they have done and they have found out lesions in the liver, but he has got also some partial obstruction. Just because there are lesions in the liver, it doesn't make it uh, inoperable. Cure is still positive, so this meaning potentially curative. So what is the options now? That's what was the plan. They thought of giving a chemotherapy because I said patient was in partial obstruction. That's what I say treatment here was neoadjuvant chemotherapy even in bilobar liver lesions. So results are quite good here. They thought like this, but then after two cycles, now patient comes with acute obstruction. So again here, coming back to the point that bridge the surgery. So this situation is a potentially curative possibility but he has come with obstruction now after finishing two course of chemotherapy. So that is what it is. So now you have got a two important charts here for the summary of whatever I've spoken to you. When you decide about the palliation, look here, short life expectancy, means less than six months. Look how comorbid is the person, depending upon which you decide, do a colostomy, especially low rectal. Low rectal don't do stenting. They don't do well, colostomy here. Other situation, you can still do a stenting. See here, high volume center, if your results are good. Now, other situation, if the bowel is gangrenous, longer life, do a resection. This, I think, is very clear as for the palliation. Now, as for the curative intent is concerned, Whenever a carcinoma of the colon is there today, as I already mentioned to you, you have to look after the nutrition, etc. And whenever you decide about the potential resections, bridge is important here. To buy some time here, you do again same way, ostomy versus stent, and take these patients, build the nutrition, and take them after two weeks for a 
whatever elective resection. So this is about the colonic cancer, left-sided, right-sided, stent, and versus a ostem. Now, obstruction with the perforation. These are some of the principles here. Again, uh, whenever they say our aim is to relieve the source sepsis, that is very, very important here. Resection doing anastomosis with or without a stoma, it is later. All this decision is at the on table, depends upon condition of the patient. I already mentioned to you right sided obstruction with the perforation. Doing a right colectomy is ideal, but you can even do an ileostomy if you have got a perforation now, which is quite away from the growth. Just look at this example here. You may have to do a subtotal colectomy sometimes, especially there is a carcinoma in the left colon and perforation is in the cecum. Is it clear? So carcinoma is in the left colon, perforation in the cecum, do a subtotal colectomy and uh, at least the recommendation is to do maintain 10 centimeter of the ileum minimum. When you do a subtotal colectomy, keep 10 centimeter of the ileal length to do what is called as ileo. Distal is the usually the rectum, ileo rectal anastomosis. That is at least for the nutrition and anastomosis should be at least remnant above the peritoneal reflection, right? So these are some of the mortalities. See here from 0 to 24, that is to go up to up to 65% in case of a diffuse fecal peritonitis. So these are about the colonic cancer. Um, a few commonly asked questions. You know, this is the usual thing. Should we do intraoperative colonic irrigation? I already told uh, here. See here, who required emergent surgery for left colon. 24 had resection anastomosis. They did the colonic irrigation here. But what is their conclusion? So they introduced a Foley's catheter through a small stab ileostem. Next, they select the proximal level of colonic division, divide the colon. They continue wash out. So you need 16 liters of saline solution. They also felt that it is safe. You can do anastomosis. So it is not that you cannot do it. You can still do it. I have already told you two options are there. You have got used to certain washout like this. You can do intraoperative colonic irrigation. There is no problem. But if you are other way is also fine. You can just do a manual decompression. It's not necessary that you irrigate that. So manual deep compression is shorter and simpler. So it depends upon your experience and preference, you can do. Preoperative -oper pre antibiotics are necessary or not. Uh, oral antibiotics, earlier they used to give erythromycin, etc. Now, metronidazole is more than enough as a preoperative antibiotics because colon Bacterial load is very high, almost 10 to the power of 12 colony forming units are there per gram of the stool. And metronidazole has got an excellent anaerobic activity and good enterophatic suppletion. So preoperatively, you give second generation of cephalosporins and with metronidazole just zero to two hours before the incision. And if the surgery takes more than three to four hours, you may have to repeat one more drug but always remember do not continue these drugs after prophylaxis so what i'm trying to tell is if you are giving this for prophylactic should not continue these drugs so these are some of the problems what happens in a colonic obstruction is a gut translocation of the bacteria so this is what happens that means they go from the gastrointestinal system to the mesenteric nodes and then go to extra nodal site. This is the reason, main reason why you need to give preoperative antibiotics in all these patients who have got a colonic cancer. What about the diet? 
Don't have to keep them starved for a long period. Clear fluids of carbohydrate rich drink is given just two hours before for a clear fluids, but uh, solid food and milk means at least six hours and fried food eight hours. So this is the minimum diet, uh, the questions which commonly asked. So why do you want to give a carbohydrate drink, rich carbohydrate? That's basically, you know, that uh, to, it reduces the post-operative insulin resistance. All these patients in the post-operative period, they go for a catabolism and they lose weight. This is what also forms the basic principle of uh, enhanced recovery after surgery eras. So post-operative thirst, hunger, all these things can be uh, reduced at least by a carbohydrate drink. No doubt about this, cancer itself is a status of precipitating factor for a deep vein thrombosis, hypercoagulation. So thromboprophylaxis uh, is mandatory. So whatever is uh, things which you are uh, used to it, you can use low molecular weight heparin, anoxoparin, deltaparin, all these are the various choices. And in the theater, there should be a compression, which is me mechanical uh, compression. Is nasogastric tube is uh, necessary? No, not required. As I mentioned, it keeps the esophagus sphincteric open and the more chance of aspiration. So, but uh, definitely indicated if there's a significant distension. This uh, I already mentioned to you, mechanical bowel preparation. Again, uh, there are two schools of thought, required, not required, whatever it is. But it improves the handling of the bowel and it's left to a surgeon's decision here. So, so mechanical bowel preparation, those who are using it, polyethylene glycol is the one which is used. It reduces the bacterial count within the colon and reduces the wound infections. But what is the disadvantage? Sometimes what happens is you are given a mechanical bowel preparation and you have done the resection there, you'll find the liquid fecal matter. That is more difficult to manage than a solid fecal matter and uh, because spillage can happen. And when you give a mechanical bowel preparation, it damages colocytes and it causes edema and inflammation. So these are the few problems associated with the mechanical bowel preparation, right? What about epidural analgesia? Definitely it is better. It's for analgesic purposes. It also helps in the better bowel moments. And today we all talk about the stress responses. It reduces period. So, so this is about colonic cancer and these are some of the commonly asked questions. So this is a different topic that is pseudo obstruction. One of the causes of colonic obstruction, I think uh, it's also called Ogilvy syndrome. The main problem is with the sacral parasympathetic nerve. You know, our parasympathetic comes from the craniosacral vagus and sacrum, you know, that usually starts somewhere in the junction descending colon. So that is the area where dilated and collapsed loop is there near the splenic flexion. So that is the increased sympathetic tone causes the colonic dilatation due to inhibition of contraction. This is called a pseudo obstruction. You would have faced this many times. All these are causes. You might be a but I've been called from a medicine ward, elderly person, diabetes or mixed edema, hypokalemia, presenting with the colonic obstruction. And you are also confused whether colon is loaded with the fecal matter, whether he is in obstruction or not. But remember, pain is conspicuously absent. In pseudo obstructions, pain is not there. Secondly, dehydration, hypovolemia, shock features, Guarding rigidity, they do not occur in this. But distension can be really troublesome. So you should be able to differentiate pseudo obstruction from a main obstruction. And if you see, it's all massively dilated uh, colon there. So you will not find multiple gas fluid levels. 
and it's a little bit of tricky situation to manage only time and patience some repeated enemas may help you so prokinetic agents like cisapride these are the things which sometimes help in this patient other condition which can give rise to colonic obstruction so we have talked about cecal valvulus sigmoid valvulus colonic cancer and just now we talked about pseudo obstruction other cause being a colonic stricture most important is malignancy rarely tuberculosis i won't speak more about it ischemic colitis usually affect the left colon especially where the splenic flexure bend is there because that's the area where relatively less blood supply you get that can give rise to stricture and uh, inflammatory bowel diseases including ulcerative colitis can give rise to a narrow tubular structure called a pipe stem colon amebiasis can heal rarely with the stricture formation in the western world diuretic la stricture is quite common so radiation strictures can occur after 2 years or even after 3 to 4 years later rarely in a female endometriomas can give rise to stricture so in other words colonic obstruction means colonoscopy will give you ultimately these are the patients who can come with acute or chronic obstructions there will be previous history of radiation previous history of diabetic like all this causes they there will be a some history whether tuberculosis ischemia ulcerative colitis so you know you are following this patient so they will have easy diagnosis compared to malignancy that is how they come with progressive obstruction and uh, you have enough time to see you do a single stage resection and do end to end anastomosis so dear friends um, i have concluded my talk colonic obstruction colorectal cancer is the most common cause i have given you the scenario of various scenarios where you want to do a curative resection potential curative resection or a potential curative with metastasis also or palliative intent even in situations radical resection is the first line of treatment both left and right single stage resection is ideal provided performance status of the patient is good patient can tolerate the surgery hemodynamically stable any slightest doubt i already told you to consider a colostomy or even a stent depends upon the situation of the patient depends upon the expertise you have got both stent both stent as well as colostomy is used in the curative intent also to buy some time so as to condition should improve so once the condition improves later you can go and do colostomy uh, closure uh, resection and colostomy closure so with this i will just say thank you for uh, your patient hearing and uh, i will take some uh, questions and uh, if you have got any questions please uh, thank free to thank you, you. prof thank, thank you prof for the thank you for the elegant and comprehensive presentation um there is a question from dr iman she is asking about uh, the definitive management of ogilvy syndrome definitive management of ogilvy syndrome is uh, basically i have already told that it is a conservative line of treatment uh, it's a very tricky situation because uh, you know yeah that's uh, so that is the ogilvy syndrome you can see the slide i think so once i mentioned about the drugs here cisapride mosapride not working you are ruled out malignancy so you try a colonoscopic decompression so if distension continues cecal tenderness persists i already mentioned to you about this then there's a role for laparotomy for the tube cecostomy i have never done up to now this this i have never done this is from the literature pseudo obstruction most of the time they do respond to the conservative treatment provided you control this i have seen a pseudo obstruction due to hypomagnesemia also hypokalemia also 
mixedema patient also once you treat the mixedema it will slowly improve i have seen a patient who has taken this anticyclic antidepressant drugs also so once you treat basically these causes invariably it responds i hope uh, i have given the answer well uh, can you hear me yes prof well uh, thank you prof i think you have covered the subject very well and it's very good for our residents uh, i have two comments the first is that uh, when you have somebody with a sigmoid volvulus and then you do a sigmoid deflation i mean these people are simple so they feel very well as they will disappear and they will come later sometime with a uh, gangrenous bowel so just my advice to the residents does be very careful about these patients because they think this is the end of the story oh, if no, you ask no, them no. to go yes 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 if you ask them to go and come back they won't the other <laughs> comment is that when you do uh, when you have a sigmoid volvulus and you do a resection the question i know I, i agree with you i mean now probably but i think you have to be very careful about to assess your patient whether you are going to do a diversion colostomy or you are going to do a primary anastomosis i, I think probably this area need to be stressed that uh, it's not always to do a prior anastomosis you have to be very careful about the if the gangrenous this the fluid feces elderly patients I mean, you, you take the safe way probably of diversion colostomy. If you think that it might not work because it will be a disaster if it has any leak like this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's hundred percent sure, sir. Because uh, a single stage resection is uh, totally left to the uh, your patient and your uh, decision at that moment because it may leak. And uh, yes, Hartman's procedure, as you mentioned, as you also mentioned, it's safe procedure. Yes. Mm. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, there's a question, Prof, from Dr. Haider. He's asking about any possibility of total colectomy or subtotal colectomy if the left-sided colonic obstruction with a hugely dilated colon, like about 12 centimeter. Any any role for that thing? Thank you. Um, I I don't know what exactly um, in which condition the question was asked. Uh, because i mentioned subtotal uh, colectomy here i mentioned here in a situation there is a cancer of the left colon maybe a transverse colon or splenic flexure and there is a cecal perforation look at the mm. scenario so in that situation you are stuck because the most of the colon is so grossly dilated there you do this subtotal colectomy one second is of course you have got a synchronous uh, carcinoma with obstruction you may have to do a subtotal colectomy but uh, at least the uh, the point here uh, one important here is at least 10 cm of the ileum has to be preserved otherwise the severe nutritional deficiency and uh, probably the control will be difficult yes okay thank you bro any other questions please any other comments or in, any comments or questions from the audience dr dr vikas yes. you are welcome yes so thank you thank you then uh there is a question prof from dr vikas yeah yeah you can Tell me. you can step forward yeah hello yes we can hear you yeah please what is the question i think due to internet connection it didn't hear us hello yeah there's supposed to be a question from the dr vikas but uh, he is not uh, reaching i think us. got disconnected maybe yes uh, yes any other comments from the audience uh, may i can i can ask prof suleman hasan to comment if he is available yes. please
I think he is connecting now, Professor Suleiman. Yes, Prof. Suleiman, if you can open the mic. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, yes, Prof, there is a question here from, um, from Dr. Vikas. He, he wrote his question. In case of sigmoid tumor, we seek a perforation. Do we go ahead with sigmoid resection? This is a question from Dr. Vikas. Yeah, the growth has to be uh, removed. So I understand there's a carcinoma of the sigmoid colon, correct? Yes, the with a sickle. Sigmoid... Perforation, yeah. I know. The situation has given a more difficult situation. So once there is a growth in the sigmoid is there and this side sickle perforation is there. So how bad is the contamination and uh, depends upon which you, you may have to decide. Otherwise, the answer will be a subtotal colectomy is a little bigger procedure because uh, it's a rare situation. I understood what, what the situation because it's not all that common. So decide on table. If the cecum is very grossly distended with the significant contamination, et cetera, et cetera. So, but uh, growth has to be, has to come out. There's no doubt about that. You remove the growth and close the cecal perforation and left to the surgeon to decide. Okay, thank you, bro. And uh, I think there's a question from Dr. Hussein Yusuf. Uh, I think you just addressed it. The, uh, the primary repair in a sigmoid volvulus. I think Professor Rashid has as well commented on that point. Yeah. Okay, if there's no other question, maybe we can conclude the session. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much, Prof, for your uh, you. valuable and comprehensive uh, talk and lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the audience. Well, may we hope you see you again next time, Thank inshallah. You. Thank you very much, Saif. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.